Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, The Importance of MGM, the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Now let me give the floor to Britt Hafner, the webinar organizer from Data Blueprint, to introduce today's speaker and webinar. Britt, hello and welcome. Hey, thanks Shannon. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for finding the time in your busy schedules to join us for today's webinar, The Importance of MDM. As always, a big thank you goes out to Shannon and Dataversity for hosting us. We will get started in just a few moments after I let you know about some housekeeping items and introduce your presenter. We have a one-hour presentation followed by a 30-minute Q&A. We will try to answer as many questions as time allows, but feel free to submit questions as they come up throughout the session. To answer the top two most commonly asked questions, yes, you will receive an email with links to download today's materials and the webinar recording so you can view this afterwards. Uh, these materials will be sent out within the next two business days. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We've set up the hashtag DataEd on Twitter, so if you're logged on, feel free to use it in your tweets and submit your questions and comments that way. We will keep an eye on the Twitter feed and we'll include answers to these questions in our post-session email. Now, let me introduce you to our presenter. Peter Aiken is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has written dozens of articles and eight books. The most recent is Monetizing Data Management. Peter is experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his and Data Blueprint's expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. He often appears at conferences and is constantly traveling. Peter, where are you today? So we're actually headed to D.C. for a couple of days' worth of work uh, up there. Thanks, Britt, and uh, welcome, everybody. The uh, topic today, as you've already figured out, is uh, working on reference and master data. This is a, a topic that we've seen quite a bit come up, but it's been real challenge for most organizations. So let's jump right in. Uh, again, in the beginning, we start out with our sort of data management credo, believing collectively that data is the most powerful yet underutilized and poorly managed organizational data asset. And as such, it is our sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic asset. When you speak about it that way, we're hoping to do that for a reason. We want people to understand that data deserves at least as good treatment as your money, your people, and the other assets that you have in your organization, and understanding that these special properties that it has are, in fact, properties that other assets don't have. This is the way in which we would continue to uh, make sure this works for everybody. Um, one of the things we see out there a lot is people are saying data is the new oil. If you Google that phrase right now, you'll get literally millions and millions of hits. And the problem with thinking about data as oil is that it, not really thinking of it as a strategic asset, but more of something that you consume. Oil is valuable and good, don't get us wrong. We like to think of it more as data is the new soil, plant something good in it, and good things will happen as a result of that. Uh, some people like us to say data is the new bacon, uh, whatever works, that's great. But collectively what we're trying to do is to help our organizations unlock business value by strengthening your collective data management capabilities by providing solutions that are appropriate to the organizational readiness to embrace those solutions and building lasting partnerships between data people, the business, and IT. So our agenda for today is uh, our usual data management overview, but then we'll dive into the subject material. What is reference and master data management? Why are they important? What sort of building blocks do we need to have in place? And then we'll finish up with some guiding principles and best practices, looking back at the top of the hour then to your questions and uh, our discussion all the way around. So let's start out with our definition of data management, and a lot of people 
take Tom Redmond's definition that data is really only important when it's grabbed in the first place and when it's used. And yes, those are true. Um, so we originally built out a, a concept that looked like this. In between when we grab it and when we use it, there's an engineering function, a storage function, a delivery function, and around that we need a governance function to make it all work. So collectively this speaks to the need for team skills, specialized team skills. But the real problem with this definition is it doesn't speak, again, it looks more like a production function. It doesn't speak to the real value of data, which is when it's reused. So I tried it with a big arrow, that worked pretty well, but we've actually moved to a, a more modern definition now, which is to say that the reuse has to be central to what it is that we do. Uh, again, the engineering, storage, and delivery are important. The specialized team skills are absolutely critical, but we have to understand how those team skills help our business partners to do what they do better, and that we also need to incorporate a feedback loop into that process, because without the feedback loop, we have no ability to break out of what we call the analytic insight uh, loop. If you have uh, questions about that, that's another webinar that we dive into at some point. But that all of this then becomes the purview of governed data. Now, another component that's critical to understand too is that data has been a lot like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, many people look at the top of the pyramid as the things they'd like to do. Uh, again, Shannon and I were talking about some music that we both love to do at the top of the hour here before we went live for this thing. And that's a great thing to do, but you can't do that if your bottom part of the pyramid is not well established. In other words, if you are lacking food, clothing, and shelter, uh, neither Shannon or I are going to be singing or playing bass or doing much of anything uh, around that. And data falls into that category here in the sense that most of the things you hear and read about data fall into this golden data triangle, what we call advanced data management practices, MDM, mining big data, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, today's topic, MDM, is, is critical on this. But all of those things do represent just the tip of the iceberg. And if we don't have a good foundation, understanding that these are important and, in fact, necessary but insufficient prerequisites, what happens is that most organizations try to do this but don't do it nearly as well. One other aspect of this, uh, before we move on to the next slide on this, which is that most of the foundational practices have to work in concert. And so what you're looking at here is an example that shows that governance, quality, strategy, and operations are relatively strong, but the link to the data platform and architecture piece are relatively weak. Well, for this organization, the prescription then is that you must improve the effectiveness of your platform and architecture components before you try and put any investment into governance, quality, and strategy, any more investment into it, because they are only going to be as strong as the weakest link. Uh, what you see here is that the top part of the pyramid, the golden triangle, is focused really on technologies, and that the bottom part is focused on organizational capabilities. And while you can do the things at the top without getting good at the things at the bottom, it will take you longer, it will cost you more, it will deliver less value, and it will present greater risk to the organization that instead you learn how to do it in a crawl, walk, and run situation of building up your foundational practices in the process of creating your advanced data management practices as well. Uh, the other half of this that's important uh, is that the data maturity model that Carnegie Mellon put out recently, uh, I'd say recently is August 2014, but still relatively recent in our, our history as data managers, and the idea that we have to manage data coherently, professionally, and maintaining a, an appropriate balance fit for purpose that uh, allows us to get data delivered appropriately, uh, that the architecture implementation and the lifecycle management are important, and that the supporting practices are important. If those things are not in place, uh, again, it becomes harder to do everything else that everybody wants to do. There's a scale for doing this. This does represent a very significant advance in data management practices and allows us to work in concert with the DIMBOK that uh, Data International uh, put out a couple years back. So we're, we're starting to make some progress in this area. Now, with that as an overview here, let's dive in and take a look specifically at what is reference and master data management. I'm going to start out with a story here of a, a company that I was working with for a couple of years. And in the first year that they were doing this, it was kind of an interesting piece. First of all, they had about three plane loads of consultants 
that would show up every week to implement the technology known as MDM. The problem was that these users that were there, while they installed the stuff correctly, the MDM solution is a technical success. It was not a business success because the users didn't understand it. They thought it was just another database. And so you would hear things like, well, I don't really know how to, to do much with this stuff, but I, I did find a place. I could stick the data in the MDM and it was fine. And, and that's really a problem because when you have people sticking stuff in the MDM, that's not how this technology should be used. It's not how this approach should be uh, used within an organization. So the general agreement at the end of the first year was that they needed to go back and restart the effort. And they, even though they had paid for it once, they paid for it a second time uh, in order to get the thing started. And when they did a root cause analysis before they jumped into that next iteration, one of the things they developed was a consensus around poor quality data. And having poor quality data in the MDM, as you will see shortly, is an especially problematic issue because the MDM becomes the framework, if you will, for the rest of what happens in the organization. So management, when they heard poor quality data, they said, well, get out there and get data quality -ing. and. That sort of took that stool back up to the top. You notice that stool is moving back and forth, and, and the reason is because we like to think of a stool as having some structural integrity, and a one-legged stool is not much fun to sit on. Uh, so by doing some data quality, that was good, but they were inexperienced with data quality, and they thought that they could simply go out and buy a data quality tool, and that would help. So I've put a second leg of the tool up there. Uh, second leg of the stool up there, and, and, and you see it's not a very strong leg because they didn't have good, strong data, uh, data quality practices that they were putting in place. Again, because they were taking a very technological focus on this, uh, it really didn't help. And so even though all of these wonderful tools clean and integrate and do all sorts of the other things that you'd like them to do, uh, it really didn't leave a lot for this organization to work on. So you'll see later on, there are some statistics around MDM and, and how difficult it is to implement correctly. Hopefully you'll get from this presentation here the right way to do it. So out of the DIMBOC, uh, we pulled this IPO diagram. Each of the, the topics that we talk to usually has something like this where we talk about the inputs on the left-hand side. You can see they're classified according to business drivers, data policy, regulation standards, code sets, master data, et cetera, et cetera, that goes into it. Suppliers of this master data, participants who are involved in the process, and then 10 primary activities that we'll talk about uh, around it. There's some tools that we use, and there's some deliverables that come out of this with have to be worked in conjunction with the consumers. And, and finally, it makes sense in this context here to look specifically at some measures around it. They label it fancily metrics, um, but the idea is just how long does it take and what should we expect so we can tell whether we're doing it better or worse as we go forward with it. Uh, three goals at the top. Uh, the real key to this is to provide authoritative sources of reconciled, high-quality, master and reference data, and we'll dive into those in just a second. In addition to that, lower the cost and complexity issues through reuse, as we talked about just a minute ago, and leverage of standards that are there, and support business intelligence and information integration efforts around this. Um, any one of those is going to give you some good results. If you get all three of them, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So what do we mean by MDM? Well, first of all, if you're out there in the web trolling around looking for things, you've got to be careful because about half the people that you talk to think MDM means mobile device management. Again, context is important and that's reasonable. But I like Gartner's definition here because what they say is that MDM is a discipline or strategy. Notice it is not a technology. And so even though this is sold as a solution, what we're really saying is, no, it's an approach. And, and so very, very key differences here, and these cause some of the confusion. So MDM is a discipline or strategy where the business and IT work together to ensure uniformity, accuracy, semantic persistence, stewardship, and accountability of the enterprise's official shared master data. Now, we'll go a little further on this and talk about some of the difficulties, but it's a great definition to start. What we're really talking about is saying in our organization is things that are somewhat 
consistent here. And the consistent things are things that we want to be shared across everybody, and they fall into the basic categories of parties, places, and things. We want our customers to understand when we're talking to them from different parts of the company that we still know they are the customer. Again, if you're in a state government, we did a real nice example out in um, uh, Phoenix a couple weeks ago where citizens uh, all together would like to be recognized as a citizen by each and every agency they come with instead of having to identify and re-identify themselves all the way around. Uh, again, trading partners, all kinds of things up there. Again, places, where are the places we do business or the places we ship to, and what are the things that we do, the products and services. I also put up on here legal entity identifiers. Those of you that are in regulated businesses, that's going to be an absolutely key aspect of, of what it is you're doing. Now, all of these identifiers provide the context to the transaction. So I'm going to use the transaction of going to an ATM machine and getting out $20. Uh, again, it's got to know who you are and where the money's coming from, whether it's coming from your checking account, your charge card, or your savings account. This is the type of thing that it allows you to do. And the, the context of master data comes from an oldish term that we used to use in mainframes called master files. And what you see here is that we used to take an old master file and a series of transactions and we would run an update program against them, taking the transactions and doing it. So if it's the $20 that I'm taking out of the ATM, I'm taking it out of the ATM and uh, uh, you know, therefore subtracting it from my account. So my balance and the new master will be $20 less than the balance that was there on the old master. And of course, we also want to make sure we have error messages that occur along the way. So this is what we mean by master data management as we look through this. In Wikipedia, MDM is looking looking at this process of golden, and this also plays into it as well, which is the idea that when Microsoft or Apple or Google release another version of software, when they release the final version of whatever it is that they're releasing, that this golden master then becomes the one everybody um, ascribes to. So if you have uh, version 9.3 of the iOS, there's a golden master, one copy of this where everybody knows it's the correct copy. In the recording industry, it was the physical entity that was sent to the manufacturing plant. Now it's, of course, the one that's on iTunes or wherever you get it from. Uh, in data management, it's the data value that represents the correct answer to the business question. Where is the customer's address? What are the things that we're trying to do? What is the proper price for our product? Uh, all of these are very, very key piece. And this planning, implementing, and controlling activities to make sure that everybody's on the same piece of paper is what we're talking about from an MDM perspective. Now let's dive a little further into this and differentiate between master and reference data. Uh, very similar type concepts, but different enough that we need to do two types of definitions around them. First one of reference data is the control over the domain values. Now, if you have a database background, the domain values are the allowable values. Uh, what this really means is that we're controlling standard terms, code values, unique identifiers for these things. But we don't have to think of it from a strictly technical perspective. Again, let me give you a very simple example on the database side. If I make a database field that is a field that can accept either numbers or letters, and then I try to read either a number or letter into it, it's not going to complain. However, if I make a database field that contains only numbers, a domain value that's restricted to only numbers, and I try to put the letter A into it, it won't work very well. Uh, this can cause confusion. Uh, many of you, for example, are, are asked to provide a record locator number by the airlines, and your record locator number may look like something AB126J. And, and they say, yes, that's a locator number. Right? Well, what they did is they took a number field and they repurposed the domain to include letters so they have many more of these six-digit uh, codes that they could put out there. And I said digit, again, six-character codes uh, in order to do this. So 
more importantly than the technical domain, though, what we really want to say is it's a business domain. And so what we're really trying to do is control the vocabulary of the organization in a way, and I'll show you some examples in a little bit, so that the, the domain lists are correct. So when we talk about customers, for example, we may have three types of customers. And I was working with a group actually just yesterday where we came up with a, a group of customers. There are retail customers, there are wholesale customers, and then they had squirrels. And I said, wait a minute, what do you mean squirrels? And they said, well, we, we actually call a type of customer squirrels. And so we should refer to them internally that way because everybody uses the term and it has special things. They're neither retail customers nor wholesale, uh, uh, wholesale customers. So I was like, really? Okay, that's fine. Interesting. Again, it was the values that the business allowed worked within there. So while we want to control the technical domains and we'd like to harmonize them as much as possible, the real impotence for reference data here should be coming from the values that the business uses, the, the terms that they use, the vocabulary that they use. So that everybody, when they talk about squirrels, they go, oh, I know exactly what you mean. It's consistent shared use of this reference data used to classify and categorize the various data pieces. So here's a specific example. Uh, again, if we use a two-letter UPS code to code the state abbreviations in the United States, uh, Virginia is what mine is, and it's VA. Um, there's a set of 50 of these, and if you use the wrong one, the post office supposedly will send that letter back to you. Uh, so you've got to use one of the allowable 50 in order to actually make it work. Uh, another example of the same kind of thing in the reference data set context might be the allowable codes for a uh, uh, foreign countries. And many people think the United Kingdom, it should be UK. And I start to put UK in for their uh, addresses, but the proper definition for this organization is GB, Great Britain. So again, you can see if they're going to only allow US and GB, uh, you put in UK, you will not get the intended results that you have. So reference data is a little bit more narrow. It's the allowable values of a specific variable. Whereas we go to master data, Master data really does control essential truth about the business in the same fashion that reference data does, but now we have a broader definition. This gives us the ability to look at business entities giving us the context for the transactions. And again, we go back to our people, parties, and um, uh, citizens in here. So the, what really is happening here is we're looking at the term in this case, what we call business rules, and how can business rules. So in other words, I have one company that we work with where a location typically means a place where they do business. And they had some confusion that occurred because they actually started giving kiosks, so these are automated things like an ATM machine, a location code, and people started trying to send mail to the location code. Now, if it's a kiosk, there's nobody there to accept the mail. So again, very, very important that we understand what that vocabulary is. So let's look at a, an example that pulls both of these together. Uh, this one here is showing you the appropriate gender codes that they used to use in Canada. I don't know if they still use nine gender codes or not, but at the time they used nine gender codes. You can see them listed there, male, female, formerly male, now female, formerly female, now male, and certain won't tell, doesn't know, male, soon to be female, and female, soon to be male. Those were the specified codes. I actually had a lawsuit that involved these one time. Uh, I have to tell you about that one over uh, adult beverage uh, at some point, but that's a fun story. So when we talk about reference data, the fact that we maintain nine gender codes becomes our reference data, and that these nine are the allowable gender codes. You can't have a gender code of A. You can't have a gender code of 10. You can only have gender codes of one through nine. By the way, if you're following current trends these days, gender codes are now up to about 63 or 66. I forget what the latest Facebook count is. Um, and many organizations are following the Facebook lead of, of characterizing and allowing people to, to identify with these particular gender codes. So this is reference data. Then the master data says that the golden source would be the gender of your customer whose name is Pat. And again, one of these values would apply if you allow nine. If you allow the 63, it would be one of the 63. So hopefully that give you a good contrast of reference 
versus master data. You'll notice that both of these provide specific context for the transaction data that we're talking about here. So let's look at, first of all, what's happening in the reference data world. And done some surveys of different people, and poor quality reference data creates problems for financial institutions, among other places. It actually provides problems for everybody, but financial institutions in particular. And that in most cases, they were trying to do this on their own by growing their own systems. And the problem is that when you grow it yourself, you have only yourself to blame when you don't get it right. So one way of thinking about reference and master data is that some data is more important than others. And if we get the important data correct, we'll actually do a little better around here than if we start to try and work with the ROT. Uh, now again, ROT is an acronym we use to describe data that is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And if it's redundant, and obsolete, or trivial, one should ask the question, uh, you know, why are we putting any effort into this in the first place? So 31% of the firms are still managing this stuff in a way that doesn't really help them, that they're not really applying these formal practices to it, and that most of these organizations are starting to move forward uh, in terms of addressing these with what we call the strategy of master data. Now, the problem with master data is that when we see organizations do this, we see them try to do it in the way that the little story that I told you at the top of the hour was. They, they go in, they buy some technology, they have it installed, and that's terrific. And, and my analogy here is it's kind of like handing the keys to the Tesla to a 16-year-old that has just gotten their license. Um, it's probably not going to result in a good outcome. Master data management has to be implemented with at least two other pillars of data management, governance, and data quality. And I showed you the examples of both of them in that example. So when we look at what's happening, data governance, first of all, makes the case and then is responsible for implementing the data quality piece. This would have kept this company that I described at the beginning from implementing a multi-million dollar solution in a way that really just sort of flushed money down the drain. They wouldn't have said, you don't implement master data unless you're going to implement quality at the same time. Because the quality is a necessary but insufficient prerequisite to the success of the master data. And of course, the master data then allows you these capabilities to constrain and, and uh, focus in on the effectiveness of the governance that's within here. So we've rarely seen an MDM initiative survive unless the organization attempts to do at least these things as well at the same time simultaneously. Uh, you can see here that it's just a, a non-trivial problem and it really needs to be addressed. So let me give you a more specific example. This is an organization that was trying to rejuvenate their contact with their customers. They had some contact with them, but they weren't really um, in as good contact with them as they'd like to be. So they identified, in this case, eight systems of record that they had where they were trying to keep track of this master data. And what they would do was implement a sort of lightweight indicator extraction service. So they could go into these systems of record and they could say, what customers haven't we talked to in the last month, day, year, again, within a certain period of time, and it would come up with a list of candidates that they wanted to become more in contact with. Uh, these were then put into a repository, uh, not their metadata repository, it was just another sort of staging area that they were able to look, because when a customer would contact this organization through some channel that they had, they could run a real quick latency check and say, how long has it been since we've talked to that uh, customer? And, and they might have a little bit of 
they could say, well, you know, if you'll spend an extra minute with us here and, and give us some additional information that we'd like to have, uh, you know, we'll reward you with some points or a toaster or something along those lines. But that would give them the ability then to update the address information, the master data the information that they were looking to get in better shape and uh, help the organization overall First of all, know when they had contacted people and how current the data was that they had uh, that was out there. They added one more piece to this particular set of operations, which was that they were buying occasionally lists of addresses from the external environment and using that to process in here as well. And again, they could do the same kind of place because they had set up a good strategy for maintaining their important customer information on this, they were better able to understand what was going on with their customer. They kind of knew what they knew, which is a big first step for many organizations. Uh, again, I can't tell you the number of organizations that I've gone into where they're able to say um, all of our data is of unknown quality, and that's generally not a good thing that you want management to have to say. Uh, so as I've mentioned here, uh, these master data management strategies are inextricably intertwined with some other things that are going on in your organization. And what you want to make sure that you do is you don't implement them as a standalone siloed effort. So in this example here, this was a different customer, but they had some knowledge management practices that they were sending routinely data into and out of their metadata practices. That's what the center of that diagram shows is their metadata management practices. And that that data might benefit master data occasionally. So they had some trips set up inside there, some rules that would put it out. And they'd say, hey, let's send this stuff over to our master data management practice and see if it can be used to contribute towards that improved solution. Uh, same thing for data quality engineering. If they would go through, they would also find this. So they would look at identified or suspected data quality problems and pick it up and move it around here. The, the point is, this is not necessarily going to be right for your organization, but that likely whatever your master data management uh, strategy is, it's going to be about as involved in order to do that. Uh, let me give you another example, same kind of thing here. Again, we're looking at governance and master data. So they're looking at some harvesting functions in the upper left, and that the governance is looking for violations and things that are, they're monitoring. Same thing for quality data and master data. And they looked at those and said, we could do all of those individually, or we could do them all together. So they had the accumulated and coordinated in a way that the organization was able to better look at the data, could look at it from several perspectives all at once uh, in order to do this. These monitoring rules, of course, were derived from the governance practices, the quality practices, the master data management practices, and would eventually result in data. Now, my, my point in showing you all of these is that it's, this isn't going to be the way it's going to work for your organization, but you probably have something that's equally as intricate, so you want to very much See if you can map that out before you get started. Because, of course, the, the reason we're in the shape that we're in is that nobody ever starts out to think it this way. But most of our organizations built a payroll system and had some payroll data, and they built a finance system and had some finance data. Uh, you know, again, you can see the various silos that are here. And the problem is when you start shifting this stuff back and forth, it becomes very confused. Now, the way you win the game of Twister, of course, is being the last one to fall over, and that's not a, a very good standard uh, on this. So what I'd like you to think about is that even though you may not have built it this way, this is a way of getting a handle on this. And the, the MDM solutions are very good at coming in and putting, if you will, a framework in, in place so that you can start to do this. Because the average organization has its customer data in 17 different locations. So if you only have their data in 16 locations, you are, in fact, above average. Uh, that's not the standard we'd like to leave things at, and we, we'd like people to be, of course, much better than that. But uh, very few organizations actually have it in only one place, and many, many more obviously have it in many places above 17. And uh, again, that's just additional time and work, so you can use the savings in that time and work to justify the approach uh, into this. I'll give you another uh, example on this. This was a company that we were working with that had purchased an ERP package, and this ERP package 
had a rule that said, uh, and it's actually a philosophy, uh, that said that any time that a product was transferred from one tank to another tank, it constituted a retail sale. And so to report the sales at the end of the year, you added up all of the retail sales. The problem is this constituted a retail sale and this constituted a retail sale for the organization, but this was not a retail sale. This was not a retail sale. This was not a retail sale. And it turned out this was not a retail sale for them either. So they couldn't actually do this. And they were faced with a dilemma of saying, okay, we can either change the software or we can change our business practices. We can do a little of both, but we certainly can't ignore this particular problem. Of course, naturally, this was discovered only after the decision to purchase the software had already been made. Uh, those of you that have heard me speak before know that I urge the data groups to get involved with the purchase of the various software packages because it gives the people who are doing the evaluation another set of information to look at before they come along and actually make the decision to buy the package. If you understand the consequences of these packages going into certain places, then you will be able to make better informed decisions all the way around about this. So this organization decided rather than modify the software, which of course they were going to have to do not just the first time they implement it, but every time they implemented, because every time the vendor released a new version of the software, they were going to have to come back and do exactly the same changes again and again and again. They decided what they would do is control their vocabulary. They refused to allow people to talk about tanks and insisted that they talk about fully qualified tanks. So here's the same tank. This is a consumer tank. This is a gasoline tank in an automobile. <clears throat> Excuse me, this was a <clears throat> tank that was a transport tank, a storage tank, a, another transport tank, and another transport tank. And by using that vocabulary, they could easily work around the very big problem that they had of all of their sales being retail sales, back out a few transactions, that were not the retail transactions and, in fact, come up with the correct information uh, financially on how to do this. Uh, of course, you also want to make sure that you're talking about the right types of tanks and not these tanks or using the word tanked uh, in here. This is, by the way, a small joke. Uh, those of you that don't understand this, this is actually not a large person. This is a person carrying some alcoholic beverages, perhaps to the football game that occurred yesterday. Uh, and uh, you stick a straw down in there and you look like you're sleeping, but you're actually sucking on a sweet golden adult beverage. For the second time I mentioned it, I must have it on the mind today. Let's get back on topic here. Reference data, how do you implement it? Well, you can see here the Data stewards are responsible for managing the codes that are used. Again, if I use the codes for the um, uh, post office system, those codes are the 50 allowable state codes that we use by the USPS. And anything that doesn't come in through those codes can't be used. If we decide that we're going to expand those codes to include the two-digit codes for abbreviation of countries uh, that we do business with, that's okay too. You can see we propagate that out throughout the organization. One of the things that's critical on both reference and master data is good change management. If we don't have good change management in place, we have very difficult time. What version of the software were you running? What version of the codes? Very, very important on how that works. You'll notice our master data architecture looks kind of the same way, and you'll see in a minute it makes sense in many cases to combine the two. But a master data record allows us then to go in and verify the transactions so that when we push this master data out to warehouses and other types of systems, they are using what is always the most current version. Again, the same comments about making sure that you have good configuration management go into place. And most organizations choose to implement this in a combined fashion, not making them the same, uh, but making them delivered through the same methods. That allows the organizations to manage these because they are similar but not the same. Uh, it gets some synergies out of that particular process. 
I love this uh, Fred Cohen's uh, comment here. These uh, these things have a 180% failure rate. Uh, what he's really doing is being a bit glib here, but he's saying, look, you know, why would you spend a lot of time doing it and redoing it when you can avoid those mistakes in the first place? And the main root causes that we have here are that many of these are less than fully satisfied, 70% satisfied, 68% can't track their governance, 25% of the client's reference master data, excuse me, reference data is duplicated. Oh my goodness, why would you do that? And 64% are planning to re-architect their data at some point in time. And over half have spent uh, $4 million a year on reference data. So there's a good piece to look at uh, and how that works out. Again, lots of failures in these areas. The real principal causes are ineffective leadership and people don't understand the cultural impact. So again, if somebody's saying something like, well, I didn't get it and I stuck it in the MDM, you know you haven't got it right in terms of how the organization gets this. Uh, another major cause is that it's implemented as a technology project. Now, from a technology perspective, again, the systems work, the software is valuable, and it actually works, but you've got to have an organization that knows how to use it properly, or you run the risk of becoming just another statistic. Similarly, you can't implement MDM as a project because it doesn't have a beginning and an end. It's a strategy. Your strategy is not a project. Uh, so again, most customers that we work with over the years have some aspect of this that they need to get better at before we can go on and achieve other goals that are in there. Now, again, if it's perceived as just an IT project, it, it almost can't succeed. Uh, again, if it's separated from data governance and data quality, uh, again, all of these are problematic in terms of how uh, it's uh, set up. But the one thing that we've noticed the most is that when you look at MDM, this master data has to be delivered in a way that is compatible with the existing business process architecture of the organization. So even though all those other things on the other page are important, this is where we see most of them fail. And the reason is because it changes the level of granularity with which the business processes are using it. So it's, it's not enough to identify just the data. You have to identify how the data is utilized in the context of these business processes. Now the problem is that only one in 10 organizations actually maintains a business process architecture, so implementing this without understanding that is absolutely perilous. So one of my favorite companies that we work with occasionally is a company called QPR that has an automated business process discovery where you can go in and do a little bit of understanding about how your processes actually work. The, the secret here, by the way, I'll tell you, it's a really good good uh, secret. It reads the log files of what's happening. So you can do a lot of this yourself. You just look at the log files of your systems and see how it's coming out. I've seen an awful lot of companies do very, very well uh, by, by taking this approach. Now, the reason it's important is because, just give you an analogy with the automobile. For years and years, we had a traditional engine where we were looking at the engine and we were trying to get more efficient. And it wasn't until uh, uh, Toyota came along with the Prius motor and they said, you know, we're not trying necessarily to replace the gasoline engine. What we're trying to do is see if we can get it to work better. So many people have these cars now. It's been widely copied. It's a wonderful success. And the idea is not to replace the uh, gasoline engine with an electric engine, but to add an electric engine. Oh my gosh, a car with two engines, what a radical concept, uh, to see how they can be made to complement each other. So if you haven't had the pleasure of driving in a hybrid just yet, you'll know that as your acceleration changes, the electric motor gets some uh, things from the braking systems and it charges up, which then charges the battery, but then when you need to use it, the electric motor starts up and then sometimes the engine kicks in as well. And it's this understanding of this different level of granularity that allowed Toyota to make the brilliant breakthrough in this area. And I don't want you to think that you should simply leave this with an understanding of your business processes. In fact, probably the area you'll gain the most out of when you do your MDM 
uh, initiative is discovering that you can slightly rework or radically rework your business process architecture to complement this newly available data. And when we have this newly available data, it can change the way in which you do business, very similar to the way Toyota changed the way cars are now driving around on the road with two engines instead of one, and we thought life was complicated enough as it is. So let's look at some building blocks around MDM. Again, the goals there are to provide authoritative source of reconciled, high-quality reference and master data. If we can get both of those to work, that's a terrific area. We'd love to lower the cost. We'd love to support the business intelligence pieces. The cost piece is really an important one, though. And, and if you have to pick one, while it sounds good to provide authoritative source of reconciled, high-quality master and reference data, most business people don't know what that is or understand how that's going to help them. It would help if you actually gave them an example of how that worked in your organization or perhaps didn't work in your organization. But the, the most prominent cost, um, excuse me, most prominent uh, leverage here comes through lower costs. Uh, and again, it's just the idea that you don't have to go through and work this way up a lot of times. Now, I'll tell you a quick story uh, that. Uh, one of our customers experienced, uh, we were working on a different project, and we found a room full of people that they had uh, in one of the organizations, and we you know, just sort of asked a couple of questions, as we do. Uh, we're kind of inquisitive types, and it turned out that they had 100 people in this room who were manually checking each and every invoice that went out to the customers. And you sort of say, wow, that sounds like an expensive, unnecessary process, what was going on? And it turns out the answer is that most of the data on the invoices arrived at the place where they were going to bill the customer wrong. So they instituted this secondary check. It took them an additional 30 days to get the billing out. And as they were looking at these bills, they check every piece. You know, did you buy a ham sandwich today? Uh, was today, in fact, Wednesday? Oh, no, it's Tuesday. Okay. And, you know, again, each piece of data on the invoice was potentially wrong. So a quick conversation with the business owner of that particular function, we said, you know, there, there is a better way to do this. And the business owner said, why would I want to do anything better? I just finished the biggest quarter of the biggest year I've ever had. As far as I'm concerned, maybe I need to add another 100 people to that room. And from his reasoning, he was perhaps not incorrect. That said, uh, again, clearly, going to the CFO and saying, we can improve your cash flow on several billion dollars worth of cash by 30 days, uh, that type of situation came about much more quickly. And again, you can see the reason that they didn't have good quality data at the billing issue, and so it's because they had relatively poor procedures for implementing reference and master data within there. Again, you could support business intelligence. Uh, it absolutely can happen, but that's a longer, harder sell uh, in order to come up with. So follow the money, and you're more likely to end up on it. So what are we doing in terms of implementing reference and master data management activities? We need to understand the integration needs. How are they used in the organization? We need to identify the master and reference data sources and contributors. It helps to map them all out and put them into a formal map. Not so much that that's going to be correct, but that when you hold it up there, people will look at that map and say, hey, have you thought about or what about or where are these? And if they aren't on the diagram, then you've actually got some more information. Uh, you need to define and maintain a data integration architecture that shows how the various systems will be able to access these master data items typically delivered through a series of services on here. That you need to implement the solution. Most of these are technology solutions. We do not see a lot of people building their own in today's environment, although you can start to build your own in the sense that if you don't want to spend a lot of money buying and reference and master data uh, solution from a vendor, you can build something of your own that duplicates the functionality in a way that allows you to prove your concept uh, on this. You've got to find out what the rules are for this. You've got to establish the golden records, actually come up with the pile of data that is good, and maintain your hierarchies and affiliations. And by that, we're talking about the ontological and taxonomical components of your organizational vocabulary. You need to plan new data sources so they can be brought in because, of course, you won't be able to build it all in one chunk and be able to have a, a way of getting this reference and master data to the business processes that need it and then, of course, have an update system 
in order to do this. What this really means is you need to find out who needs what information, what data is available from what sources, how does the data from the different sources be reconciled, can be reconciled uh, in there, and, and then how should valid values be shared in the organization. This means that you're going to be looking at data cleaning, master and reference data, uh, again, data models, documentation. You're going to be looking and trying to figure out which is the reliable reference, the reliable master data, and to get golden uh, records in there. And this means that you're going to be tracking the lineage of these things. And that you're going to start to look at quality metrics all the way around. Because again, if you don't have an idea of how long it's going to take, you won't be able to cost it out in any reasonable shape at all. Three classes of roles and responsibilities here, but you can see again very clearly the data governance team is going to be a huge contributor to this process, and it's probably one of the areas that they need to first get started. Again, if you haven't got a governance set of stewards and things, it becomes uh, IT telling the business they should do something in the business telling IT as opposed to a shared responsibility within that context. I mentioned you could build your own using a combination of ETL. There are, like I said, lots of applications that are out there, but you're probably going to need to have some formal definitions of what these data structures look like. I mentioned before, process modeling tools can be extremely helpful in this process, and data profiling uh, tools as well as metadata management technologies are going to be helpful. Uh, all the way around. Again, once you understand what the reference data should look like and what the master data should look like, you're going to want to cleanse it to try and improve it. Uh, again, just imagine, if you will, the idea of being able to say at the beginning of your exercise, all of our data is of unknown quality. A very scary thing to say, but if it needs to be said, by all means, say it. And then say, but we've now, after a year into the process, identified some of our data as master data. And we've now taken that master data. We're pretty sure that it's 98% accurate. Uh, that represents a very significant milestone uh, in order to do that. And, and uh, again, within that, we also want some integration tools, the business process, and rule engines. And finally, of course, we've said all along change management technologies as well. So our last section here, then, is looking at some guiding principles and best practices around that. This is where you really do get the idea that there is no ownership of data. I like people to own processes. I do not like them to own data because if they own data, then it's mine and you have to negotiate with me for it. Data is a shared resource, and the shared reference and master data belongs to the entire organization. So this is one of the things we want to look for. Data management, then, is an ongoing data quality improvement program, and these goals can't be achieved by a single project. The business data stewards are going to be governing the data and determining what are the appropriate golden values that are in this context. Similarly, these golden values will be anointed to represent the best sources. So that I may have 17 sources of customer information in my organization, but we prefer you use source number three because we've determined that is the gold standard. Uh, we only want to then replicate master data values from these golden sources. And if you have data that ends up in spreadsheets, one of the things you have to set up as part of a governance program is that those spreadsheets are periodically updated with your most current set of master and reference values. And again, can't say it too many times, need formal change management. So again, our best practices in this area are really looking at active executive sponsorship, the business owning the data, not any component of the business uh, on this. I, I would say this one just on number two. I've worked with a lot of organizations, and this has been one of the hardest things that I've had in my practice to get people to buy into is to say, look, if you will make a statement that this data belongs entirely to company X or Big Co or whatever company that we're working with here, that will go a long way towards solving your problems. And most chief executives just go, ah, we don't work that way here. So I can't do that. I, I, I just can't stress the importance of that. Uh, again, strong project management and organizational change management, a holistic approach, people process and technologies all the way around. Uh, build up your processes 
of doing master data management implementation so you can have a continuous improvement process. But the management needs to understand the dedicated team, that you can't do this off the side of your desk, and that this hub model that I showed you in the two architectures earlier allows formal definition of integration between system points, which means that we can further build on it and strengthen the capabilities of the work that's been done, resist the urge to customize, and stay current with the patches, and then, of course, test, test, test all the way around here. So a couple things to finish up as we head towards the top of the hour. Again, success is more likely and more frequently observed as users understand the strengths and weaknesses of the MDM. Small steps are better than large steps in this area. Expectations management, we're not going to get all of our master data out there long at once. That long-term success requires the information architecture we talk about all the time, a governance framework, and strong alignment with the business vision. Again, using MDM, you can allow people to understand all aspects of the program here. Gaining the sponsorship, creating a vision, and using the measures hierarchy I've spoken about, very critical. A business case development that says, look, if you do this, we will save X. Okay, or, or be able to deliver faster. Again, all of these things are good. Uh, getting the business to propose and articulate their own KPR, KPIs in this process. Measuring before and after to determine the implementation. Translate the changes of the metrics into financial results uh, on here. And again, working together, we'll get all of these things to work in concert. Now, speaking of music, uh, I have a couple times at this uh, you may want to put your music on for a little bit here or turn your speakers up for just a little bit because this is a kind of an interesting articulation of an MDM. And this is a, an example that comes to us from British Telecom. It's a wonderful company that's done some really innovative things. And I just want to show you, imagine getting an email from the uh, president of the organization and uh, having this occur. <laughs> didn't freak anybody out except all the rest of the people on the floor here that I'm on. But the idea is when the head of a company sends you out an email and you open the email and see a really clever animation like that describing what their MDM initiative is going to be, it is one of the best articulations that I have absolutely ever seen. More importantly, British Telecom actually tracked the number of people who opened it virtually the entire company, because it was so novel, everybody go, have you seen this? But in addition to that, when they went back and asked people after, well, by the way, they could also track the number of times, so most people watched it two or three different times. Uh, how about that for a, an email? You know, how many people read your email two or three different times? Uh, but when we went back and looked, they could actually tell us what some of the seven sisters were. In other words, what were some of the various piles of data that we were going to put in place as part of this initiative. So it's a tremendously effective exercise. Uh, people ask for that all the time. It's out there on our website. They told us we could use it and reuse it. And so if you'd like to download a copy of it, it is out there for your availability, but uh, you know, don't use British telecoms. Uh, go ahead and spend a little tiny bit of money, get somebody to do a neat little animation like that, and make one of those that's relevant for your organization. I'll finish up here just at the top of the hour with the hardest part of MDM. And I tell organizations they should absolutely not move forward with an MDM project unless they can answer the following question. How, when we look at a piece of data, are we going to be able to tell whether it is master data or reference data? In other words, there has to be an objective criteria for determining it. So one of the things you could say about our master data is that we have, let's just say, 100 customers for this organization. So master data, the first version of it, remember we're going to have several versions, the first version of our master data will be the data that identifies our 100 customers. That's a very objective standard. 
most organizations have trouble coming up with that objective standard and consequently they don't know what data to include or exclude in their master data management efforts and have a very bad experience as a result. So we're back here at the top of the hour. Again, this is what we looked at over the hour, the uh, summary of the reference in master data management here. You can see again the inputs, the processes, and the outputs. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful and now we can uh, turn it back over to Britt for some questions. I've also included uh, yeah. in here, sorry, Brett, yeah, uh, a couple of reference pieces in there so you can take a look at it as well, just uh, additional stuff for you to take a look at. And there you go, Brett, I gave you a false start. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, no worries. Um, I've got two questions that have come in, and I've been checking the hashtag data ad, and I haven't seen any there yet. But uh, the two questions uh, we can start with are, can MDM be located in clouds? If yes, can you please give some examples? Well, I think the short answer is yes, but let's think about what we use clouds for. Um, by the way, we were running this around the office the other day of a, uh, uh, it's a little meme that was out on the Internet that said, there is no cloud, it's just a computer somewhere else, right? Um, kind of a funny little piece, and, and it's not to put down the, the very big advantages that clouds bring in. So the question is, what might a cloud-based solution to master data look like? And again, if you watch the Microsoft commercials that are clearly ubiquitous at this point in time, uh, it's, it is a great way of not only providing that reference and master data, but actually delivering it, which is uh, one of the things the Microsoft Cloud has proven quite good at. So yes, it can exist in the clouds. The question is, you have to remember that most cloud-based solutions charge you by the input and output and that transaction fee can end up being very problematic. In fact, if you want to look a little further, there's you can Google death by AWS, Amazon Web Services. And there's a part of many startup organizations where they've done a great job of putting much of their technology out there in the cloud, but all of a sudden they've become successful in that they're actually making, uh, uh, selling products, but managing their cash flow is problematic, and so they have trouble man paying their Amazon Web Services bill. So death by AWS is a really interesting topic to go follow out there. Uh, so again, back to the, the question though, can these things be in the cloud? Sure. Uh, the question is, is that the most appropriate delivery vehicle for you? And what you need to go back is look at and say, what are the deliverables, where are the consumers, and how's the best way to deliver it? If you have a lot of cloud support already and the organization has determined an economic model that works in this, then implementing uh, master and reference data in the cloud is not a problem. If it's your first one, I don't know that I would recommend that right away, but again, look at your organization. Is it a highly concentrated organization? Is everybody existent within a single building? Uh, maybe cloud's not the best way, but in a highly distributed environment, it might be a perfectly good. So there's many things that go into it beyond just should I put it in the cloud. It's should I put this type of functionality in the cloud and will my organization benefit from that? So I hope that answers the question. If not, please feel free to ask a follow-up on that. Okay, yeah, I think I got it. Um, the next one I had was, can we just implement MDM with data warehousing so that downstream data marts reporting can have business benefits? So what a and great question. Yeah. Let me do There's that one and then we'll come back to the follow-up. Well. Yeah. So if you look at the slide here, what you're looking at is I think what the question was asking, which is to say that there's a separate component. Now, by the way, it doesn't have to be outside of the data warehouse. You can move a part of the data warehouse and dedicate it to the functionality the same way as you can dedicate the cloud to that functionality uh, of this. But that absolutely controlling the values that are in the data warehouse make perfectly good sense. Um, one of the uh, interesting pieces that pops up from time to time is that people look at data warehousing and say, all right, well, how does this work within a data vault kind of context? Uh, again, that's a different talk that we do where we talk about data vault, but the, one of the things data vaults allow you to do is encapsulate different metadata sets for different periods in time. For example, I'll, I'll just make this overly simple, but at one point in time we decided there were two gender codes, M and F, and so for those sets of rules we would use one set of reference data that was just a M and F identifier 
for gender. Then we went to the nine digits uh, that we talked about for the FBI and the Canadian Social Security System that was in place about a decade ago, uh, and we used those for another put in time. And then we went to the Facebook system that has 63 different variants of gender codes. Well, each of those in terms of the reference and master data uh, would be used within a component of that, and that's where you might want to use this type of an architecture to say, when I retrieve this record, retrieve it using this set of gender codes. When I retrieve the mid-decade stuff, use it during the one through nine codes. And when I retrieve it, everything since Facebook's been online, then we use the 63 codes. Uh, again, hopefully that makes sense, but yes, absolutely. It's a great place to start out. You probably don't want to, in fact, start out your reference and master data by being absolutely inclusive of all of this. So again, great question. All right. There was a, there was a second part of that question as well. Uh, it was, should it be implemented to work with transactional and operational systems as well? So when you look at it, what you really want to look at is not so much the distinction between transactional and operational systems, but really yes on both of those. But what you're really looking for is when I go to do my BI and, and more longitudinal types of analyses. And again, if you want it to be consistent across there, I'm not sure how you would get it to work correctly otherwise. Um, think of the alternative as being something like incorporating birth date, uh, sorry, the age of the customer in the record, it's only going to be valid for a year. So you want to make sure that you, you use the right framework for analyzing your transaction data in whatever circumstance it's used, in transactional data and operational data, and again, in our warehousing types of contexts as well. So again, good question there, I think so. Okay. Uh, Another question came in. Uh, you mentioned there is no data owner. Can you elaborate? How do you get business to take ownership of definition, definitions and source of the truth? Great question. So the, the problem with identifying an owner is that the owner then becomes associated with their position on the organizational chart. And that is a big, big problem. If we say all the data belongs to the organization, then the role of the steward is in fact to make sure that data is useful for the scope of its use. Some data is used only within a work group and its scope of, of, of use is only within that work group. Some data is used across work groups and its data scope then becomes across departments, across silos, and some data is used between our organization and our partner organizations. And again, it's important to use that, although we can't control what other organizations do with our data when they get to it, we can at least advise them in that area. So the word ownership is a great thing for a business process. I love to have business process owners, but when somebody owns the data, it creates nothing but problems. So we say the data belongs to the organization as a whole, whether it's an, a nonprofit organization or whether it's a for-profit organization, it still belongs to the organization, and it's the steward's role to make sure that the data is providing the best use for the organization all the way around. Think of stewardship like stewardship of the land, stewardship of natural resources. When I was a Boy Scout, they'd tell us to go in and leave nothing but footprints, right? Well, in a steward context, you're going to make sure the data is utilized to the best uses of the organization as opposed to the best uses of any particular aspect of the organization within there. Okay, great question. It's a highly controversial question, but process owners, yes. Data owners, no. Okay. And then my next question is, should MDM include big data? <laughs> okay. Um, the definition of big data is precisely not supportive of this kind of a structured approach. However, you can use the frameworks of reference and master data that you use to help you do identity management in big data environments. So I'm slightly parsing hairs here, and let me just make sure I'm, I'm clear about this. Um, within big data, you're not 
necessarily looking at transactions. What you're looking at are trends and and um, um, you know directions and things like this. Uh, again, if you remember the distinction between ACID, which is the standard transaction, and BASE, which is the big data approach to this, big data is not about you wouldn't use it to do a payroll, you wouldn't use it to get the $20 out of the ATM machine. That's not what it's for. But big data can tell you what's going on in contextually in your environment, and if you use this reference and master data architecture that you create, it can be helpful to identify these trends that are occurring in that area. So I wouldn't think that you would include your big data as part of your reference and master data architecture, but I would think you would have it accessible so that if you needed to, you could do some quick categorization, some quick classification, some early um, ability to get value out of the data in there. It's a great question. We see a lot of people getting confused with that. Okay, and then I have another one here. Let's take here. Make sure I'm not missing one. Oh, I have a couple now. Okay. Uh, one of the issues our enterprise is facing is the myth that our data is good enough. How do you suggest helping enlighten leadership so it is a top-down approach for MDM initiatives? It's a great question. So very much like the story that I told of this logistics company that we were talking about early on, um, they just had the best quarter of the best year they'd ever had. That's pretty good. It's hard to go in and say your data sucks under those circumstances. Um, the organization is functional. It's doing things. There are things that are happening. Those are all really good things. What you want to say is there's things that we could do that would be better. So if you're going around crying chicken little and the sky is going to fall, management's going to look around and say, no, it's not. It's actually in pretty good shape uh, from a financial perspective. It's up to you to go around. And, and quite frankly, this is the part um, – of our business that we find the most. By the way, we tend not to get paid to do this. This is really interesting. Uh, Data Blueprint, when we're, we're working with organizations, they need our help to develop this business case, uh, you know, to, to, to say doing this would help make things faster, better, and cheaper. And the question becomes how much. So we do oftentimes, uh, I think our longest sort of dance on this was about two and a half years we worked with one one group that was trying to do exactly what the, the questioner is trying to do here is convince management that by investing more in their fundamental data management practices, it would help the business in very tangible ways. Uh, so we'll have lots and lots of these conversations, but, but you all are the experts. You know what your organization is spending time and money doing. So let's go back to um, this picture here of all the, the tanks. Uh, if you're differentiating between all the various bits and pieces in your organization looking at the various tanks and things, um, it's going to be a challenge for you to uh, tell them, well, you know, every time we do something like this, I've got to spend 10 minutes finding out what type of a tank it is so that I know whether I'm issuing a debit or a credit on this particular uh, transaction ledger. Um, and you do that, you know, 10 minutes a day times 10 people. Uh, let's pretend they're getting paid $10 an hour, and you add it up for 10 weeks, and you've pretty much got some good money in there. Uh, so it's absolutely up to you all and, and collectively us as data people to help our organizations understand the effects that are happening in organizations around this. If we can't put it in dollar terms, then it's very unlikely that the organization is going to be receptive to this kind of an idea uh, on this. Uh, I'll give you another example uh, on this. Um, I've mentioned a couple different times that the uh, Data Blueprint helped out with the uh, Army Suicide Mitigation Project. Uh, as we were doing this, uh, we were in the um, working on, uh, for the military at that particular point in time, and, and so we built the first one. And, and the idea here was that while we did a good job on it, that that didn't have any dollar cost that we could put on it. But all we had to say when we encountered any resistance was, um, you know, this is actually for the troops. 
and people would actually pay a lot of attention to us at that point in time. Uh, so again, the, the, the value has to be something that the people in the corner office are going to understand. Most organizations, it's dollars. Sometimes it's something a little bit less tangible. Sometimes it's something as concrete as a human life. Uh, but you've got to be able to communicate in terms that they care about because if you can't, they're going to have a very difficult time understanding to you the difference even between master and reference data, much less the fact that some data, not all data is equal. Let's just say it that way. Uh, again, great question. If you have specific questions about that, give us a ring. We'll be glad to chat with you about it uh, and help you brainstorm ideas around that, that concept. Actually, I have one here that's probably a pretty good follow-up to how you had uh, ended that response. It was, uh, from data capture and data quality process steps, how do you contrast reference data to master data, considering both belong to master data management? Great question, and the idea here is that there are oftentimes more similarities than people would think about initially. So the idea of an integrated reference and master data architecture is something that your organization should consider. Uh, remember, what's happening here is that we're doing two things simultaneously in this combined architecture, and you could do them separately. In, in one instance, when we're looking at reference data, what we're doing is we're saying these are the values, and again, I'll put it in very crass terms here. These are the genders we're going to allow our customers to uh, self-identify with. Uh, in the early days it was two, then we went to nine, and now we go to 63. Okay, so there's a change management system. We have to know which generation they came under so that they know whether they're using M and F zero through nine or whatever one of the 63 codes are that we've, uh, that we've allowed Facebook to tell us uh, belong here. So that's for reference data, and we've got to deliver that to all of our systems so that when we capture data, it checks it to say the gender codes. You can have, uh, uh, again, one or the other. By the way, I have to tell you one of my favorite um, websites that I saw at one point in time was a Rolling Stone website. Not the Rolling Stones, but Rolling Stone magazine, and it said gender, and people would simply write yes. <laughs> or it actually said sex, and people would simply write yes under it. Well, yes is not a gender code. Uh, so if you don't capture these things early on, you can't do it. And this is every form of capture, whether it comes in on a website, a telephone input, uh, 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 you know, any, any piece of this here. This, anything that's going to be putting data into your transaction system that you want to be governed by these reference pieces. The master data then, very similarly, is saying, look, if you're updating, you have to be an already existing customer. So I've got to be able to tell the difference between this person and that person. And I'll give you guys a perfect example here. My brother and I have owned houses together in the past. My brother has never owned a condominium or a timeshare, and I've never owned a condominium or a timeshare. But I constantly get letters addressed to me at my address, addressed to him, my brother, at my address, uh, wanting to uh, help us get rid of our timeshare that we have. Now, this is not they're not just randomly shooting in the dark here. Somebody somewhere along the line believes that we owned a timeshare and that we want to get rid of one of them. And I've called these folks up and they say well, they're really sorry and they'll take us off the list and all this sort of thing. But just imagine the amount of advertising dollars that are, are being lost in this. Again, the idea here is similarly to the gender values that we're allowing to go through the organization, we also then want to have only these customers go through. And so everywhere that you go, if you're going to update or do a transaction, it's got to identify that this is either me or my brother or neither of us uh, in here. And this is the allowable list of customers and that when a customer makes a change, we don't just take the change. We make sure that it is the change attributable to this particular exact specific customer. And when I've identified them and the best source of it, guess what? It becomes a whole lot easier to cleanse that stuff and to improve the quality of that data around it, which goes back to the business case overall. You're probably dying death by a thousand cuts out there because you don't have good control over these master data items in the organization. Great, great pairing of those, Britt. That's like a wine and a, and a piece of cheesecake at the end of your meal, right? Right. Just, yeah, just a little bit. Um, okay, I have one more question here, and uh, we'll see if any pop through as, as you're answering this one. But uh, organization-wise, what is the best practice to establish a data governance board? Who are the who are the who are minimally needed people slash skills to set up this board? That's a great question. The 
data governance board, first of all, you need to establish the justification for it in the first place. And the justification is data governance is managing data with guidance. So it's real easy to ask the question, do you not want your sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic asset to be managed without guidance? And the answer, of course, is no. And so in order to get that guidance in place, you need to start out with some small group of people who are concerned with doing what one of the other questioners asked, which is how do I make a business case for this? And if I can make a business case that says managing data with guidance will help the overall performance of the organization in one area, just one area, um, again, if I invest $1 and get $2 back out of it in the first year, most people would say that's a pretty good deal. Uh, so you need to have enough of a group and enough of a span that somebody's going to notice these results. Generally, our rule of thumb on this is that if you haven't got at least three people concerned or kind of agitated and maybe perhaps even a bit missed at you, you probably don't have the right scope. So, so we say unless there's three people that are kind of pissed off at you, excuse my language there, um, you're probably not going to be effective with that initial data governance uh, piece in there. Uh, again, lots more information on governance. Uh, there's a whole conference we've got coming up in June uh, in San Diego that's dedicated to that subject. Uh, I'll be there. Britt, are you going to be in that one? Uh, I think I may be, actually, for that okay, one. Okay, so you may be out there. Um, uh, again, uh, DGIQ, if you Google it on the web, you'll see it, or I'm sure it's out at the Data Diversity site. Uh, Take a look at it, but lots of places to learn additionally about that. Uh, again, any questions at all, feel free to follow up with us uh, on that as well. Right. we get any more questions? We got one more that pops up, right. actually. Right. It's, uh, is there any role of DQ process on the externally maintained reference data? Well, when you say it's maintained externally, you're going to have to ask whoever's maintaining it. Um, you know, we did one project where we were working with an organization whose main business model was to sell subscriptions, but they didn't control the subscription input process. In other words, they didn't control the data that went into the list of people who they should be sending subscriptions to. And so we found out that only 30% of the data provided by this external provider was actually of use to the organization. And we said, well, gosh, that probably isn't conforming to your service level agreement that you have with the data provider. And they said, we don't have a service level agreement with these guys. And we said, oh, well, that's really easy to fix then. Let's put one in place and tell them that they can only provide you with good data. They can't just provide you with data. Uh, again, so that's probably a great place to leave it at that point. But a great, great question around that. If it's an external process, you need to ask them, what are your controls that you're putting in place around this external data? Because after all, I'm not going to pay you for it if it's not worth anything. Brett, you are one heck of a fast typist, sir. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did have one more that came in from uh, hey, we'll the same person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was uh just what are some of the ownership differences between reference and master data? I'm sorry, say it again. What are uh what are the ownership differences between reference and master data? Ah, uh, ownership differences. Well <laughs> again, I would see more synergy managing them in concert than separately. I, I don't see a lot of organizations that, that try to do it separately. I guess in some senses the reference data may be more standards-based, so there may be less direct ownership in the organization uh, on that. For example, we use a lot of different standards uh, in, in our practice, and many of them are developed by external sources. Um, but but realistically, from an ownership perspective, yeah, I'd rather see them managed with the same group rather than separately. I think that's the nature of the question. If it's not, shout us real quick.
think we've lost okay. Brett to typing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. Yep. We've got, uh, we've got yeah, a, I... going on in the chat. Um, let me just jump to some of. You want to jump to some of those, Brett? There's a ton of questions coming in in the chat section. Uh, in the... Another whole section we didn't know about. Can I see them, Shannon? Is there something I can get to? <laughs> You know, uh, one question that came in, Peter, you, you talked about data quality earlier. You know, is, is master data management the best place to manage data quality? And, and I know we've got that conference coming up, and, and there's certainly definitely – did you want to add anything to your current statement? Well, let's, let's, let's look at it from what we're doing. First of all, you've got all your data, and that's just a daunting task no matter what. But if we go back and say some of this data is going to be really crucial for us, and then we manage that data with quality, we tend to look at master and reference data as the first place organizations should implement data quality uh, uh, as they're doing it. And again, one of the things people try to figure out is where do I start? Well, it's absolutely the place we recommend in most cases to do it because it's going to help you in a multiplier effect. So when you start to put your reference and master data in better shape, your transactional data improves consequently as well. So yeah, absolutely great, Shannon. Yeah, Rich, I, you I find think, chat? You know, <laughs> I, I think my chat actually gave up on me here because it, it stops right at 320, so I didn't get any, uh, haven't gotten oh, any no. additional ones. Yeah. Well, here, let me just have a couple of others. Yeah, go ahead, Chad. Yeah, we've got, a couple, we've got time for a couple more. Um, uh, how does ontology management differ or help with MDM? Mm, great question. All right, so as we're talking about ontological components, what we're talking about is defining the vocabulary. Uh, some of that is related strictly to uh, taxonomies, and some of it is more more defined in terms of vocabulary. So those of you that have heard me speak before know that I like to define enterprise architecture and, and information architecture in particular about talking about these vocabularies. Taxonomy talks specifically about the hierarchies that we use. And if we go to ontologies, it's about the way in which we use these terms within the business. So when we look at things like reference data and master data, these are, the, in fact, the terms that we use. Now, I'll go one step further because the question earlier was asking about governance. So the language of data governance is metadata, and much of the metadata is about is concerning this reference and master data here. So when somebody says our customer data sucks, you want to say, well, what do you mean by our customer data sucks? You say, well, we're always addressing women by male titles, right? Well, okay, this is a place where uh, improving this control over your reference data might actually help. And in fact, you'll discover that you used to use M and F, but instead now somebody's using two and one, and they've got them reversed so that all the females get a male title and all the males get a female title. Uh, and again, you can see how that works out very, very badly. All of these things are providing context for the transaction data, and that's exactly what we want to do. Sure, and, and you know, there's there's some really great questions here. One of the best things about this webinar series is Peter will um, write up answers to any questions that uh, we had, didn't get a chance to get to. So keep the questions coming. Um, you know, there's a couple in here too that could take up a whole webinar in and of themselves. But let me see if I can get to um, a couple that we have time for. Uh, should the M master data management be in the cloud? That's what we did. And so, yeah, from the cloud perspective, it can be. But I wouldn't let your MDM solution drive that decision. What I would look at instead is what are the needs of the organization in terms of information delivery. And that's what you would drive, the, drive that decision with. There's a lot of questions here, too, that you addressed already. Um, just in dealing with a NoSQL, uh, when you were talking about big data, um, there's a lot of questions about dealing with a non-relational uh, environment and NoSQL no data sources. Um, specifically, can the golden record be from a NoSQL data source? Well, originally, but it's not going to be of much use to if you can't put it in an architecture where you can make use of it. So if it's just sort of out there somewhere, uh, that's not going to be helpful for you. Again, what we're looking for is can we get it to something that looks like this, where we know how to use it. And again, one of the things about big data is that the rules are a little different, the uses are a little different, the, the purpose of it is a little different, and actually in some cases a lot different um, out there. So I would not look to I would never look to establish reference and master data within a big data environment. I would instead bring the big data through and perhaps use the, the reference and master data 
uh, framework as a way of starting to classify trends and things within your big data environment. Sure, and final question, I think we have time for Peter. Um, what's the concept of a virtual MDM? <laughs> so all of these can be implemented in, in Again, what's the opposite of virtual, right? But in, in a, a context where you can use them. And there are companies that provide service and subscription services to certain uh, things, uh, which makes perfectly good sense. For example, uh, when you stick a CD in your iTunes uh, software, uh, the computer doesn't know anything at all about your CD other than the number of tracks that are on it and how long each track is. But it goes out to the GraceNote master data solution and looks at the specific attributes of that CD and comes back and says, I think this is a new, oh, let's just say um, a Miles Davis CD. And then it'll, you know, sometimes it'll ask you questions. Most of the time it's pretty sure, and it populates it with the questions. And it happens so quickly, most people aren't even aware of it. Um, now, is that a virtual master data solution? Yes, it's not in your computer. It's not anywhere. And as long as you're connected to the Internet when you stick that CD in, you'll get that solution. So can you do more of that? Yes. Will that meet the business needs? The GraceNote CD master data management solution works great for the millions and millions, literally billions of people around the world who play music CDs. Of course, that's changing now that we're moving to streaming music and, and we're including it along with it. So that would be an example of virtualization. Will that business model work for everybody? Absolutely not. You can imagine here at the university, if I were to say, oh, I'm going to go out to some third-party database and figure out what sort of student you are. No, no, that we get into all sorts of, of issues there. So the thing for virtualization, yes, it can be implemented technically that way. Does it make sense for your organization to do it that way? That's really the question. And again, it's the same thing we talked about with the cloud. So Shannon, thanks for jumping in there. Uh, we appreciate that a lot. We had a little yeah, glitch yeah. with that, and we're sorry we didn't get all the questions, but uh, sounds like we, we recovered some of it. Absolutely. And you're going to be there in the uh, Data Governance Conference too, Shannon? You know, I, we haven't decided yet. I usually attend one of the three data governance events each year. I don't go to all the conferences as I'm busy managing the webinars and the website, but. <laughs> well, let me but, think. San Diego, Orlando, or Newark? Hmm. I know, right? It's tough. <laughs> 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 I did go to Jersey last year, but uh, that's right. We saw so that you was, there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, um, Peter and Britt, for for this. Anything uh, you want to close out with, Britt? Yeah, I can just do a closing remark here. Uh, thanks everyone for participating in today's event. We hope you have enjoyed it, and thanks again to Dataversity and Shannon for hosting us. Once again, you will receive today's materials within the next two business days. Our webinar next month will be Data Architecture Requirements on March 8th. Hopefully you will be able to join us for that one as well. As always, feel free to contact us and if, if you have any questions, and thanks everyone and have an awesome day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Shannon. Bye. Bye-bye.